Here's a question. How do rural communities get funding for important, expensive projects without burdening taxpayers? Oftentimes, it means involving the USDA. Good morning, I'm Josh Durso, and this is Inside the FLX. Today, we're discussing the USDA's rural development initiatives, which are far more expansive and complex than many folks realize. Jim Wellfriend, a community specialist and area director for the USDA's Western New York region, and Richard Mayfield, New York's USDA Rural Development Director, joined us in studio to discuss rural development and a lot more. The two answered a lot of important questions and set the stage for local leaders and community members alike to ask more questions, get involved, and even find more funding for their community. Thanks again for listening today. The entire conversation is coming up uninterrupted right after this quick message. Today's episode is brought to you by the FingerLakesOne.com Marketing Alliance, your one-stop solution for all things local digital marketing. Are you a small business trying to navigate the world of marketing and advertising? There are a lot of options. New Pure Research shows that people are overwhelmingly choosing digital over print and radio for local news, and our reach proves that. In 2018 alone, FingerLakesOne.com was accessed more than 22.5 million times. FingerLakesOne.com has been delivering the most comprehensive news product in the region since the beginning, all the way back in 1999 when and internet news seemed like a far-fetched pipe dream. In the 20 years that have followed, millions of readers, viewers, and listeners have been asking for local leads on things to do, places to stay, and services offered. They aren't just clicks or impressions, they're real-life people who want to spend their money. Shouldn't they be spending it with your business? Getting access to those leads, a growing diverse digital audience is affordable too with the Marketing Alliance. In 2018, the average cup of coffee costs $2.70. If there's anything we know, it's that small business owners live on coffee. That adds up to $81 a month and also happens to be a dollar more than a monthly Alliance membership. Get leads, share specials, events, and gain exposure that grows by the minute on FingerLakesOne.com. To join or learn more, click on the FLX Deals tab at the top of the FingerLakesOne.com homepage or by visiting deals.fingerlakesone.com. Really interesting conversation on tap today. Uh, we're talking about rural development, something you guys uh, work in every single day. Um, Richard, let's start with you. Uh, background and what your position is and how you work with the USDA and, and what that role looks like. Uh, also, give us a little tidbit of what, uh, what the USDA is uh, sort of on the ground. Well, thank you, Josh, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. You know, this partnering with uh, local outlets for helping us to get the message out to our partners and constituents and local elected officials, this is where it's really at. And it's so critical for us to be able to uh, connect with folks such as yourselves because truly we have very limited ability to advertise. So without these partnerships and abilities to um, you know, get our word out on our programs, it would be very difficult for us to operate. The United States Department of Agriculture goes back to the Civil War. Good old uh, President Abraham Lincoln uh, founded our department back in the 1860s, and we've been evolving ever since to meet the needs of rural America. And that's not just farmers. Uh, of course, folks think of farming or the USDA stamps when you go to the grocery store to see your sirloin steaks and the various cuts of meat, but we're so much more than just that uh, aspect of it. We are involved in developing our rural communities so that they have the same opportunities to thrive as our cousins in the city. So we get involved with everything from water projects to single family housing to multifamily housing to economic development activities that support employment within rural America, health issues. Uh, I, th I hope that in the time that we're together, we'll be able to share with you a, a host of issues and that somewhere someone's gonna say, hey, that might really work out in my community. And that's what we really would like to do because we want to be partners with our rural communities. Yeah, and we're definitely gonna cover a lot of ground. Um, we've been set up well uh, for this, this conversation. Uh, Jim, how do you fit into the, the, the equation in how uh, the USDA operates uh, on the ground? Well, thank you first for having me uh, here to participate today. Again, my name is Jim Walfran. I'm the Community Solutions Specialist out of the Innovation Center in Washington, D.C., although I am outstationed here in New York. 
Um, I, previous to that was the area director for Western New York for the, over 10 years and recently took the position at the Innovation Center in Washington. Um, our Innovation Center is, is composed of three different areas. One is the data analytic area, the regulation area, and the area that I work in is partnership. In our partnership area, we try to support the goals and the outreach efforts of our State Director Mayfield. Um, we're also participating in some national programs. Um, what the partnership team is able to do also is take local community um, issues and concerns, bring that to the national level, and because there's so many of us partnered out throughout the United States, we're able to communicate with our various partners and, and bring those um, opportunities back and ideas back that have worked well in other communities back to our community so we can support on a national level what goes on on a local level in the state. So to that end, uh, obviously uh, Richard rattled off several uh, important areas uh, where you guys sort of focus your work. Um, I want to start with housing. Uh, in what ways do you guys sort of uh, interact with local communities, local agencies to help spur along or help assist um, with sort of housing development in these communities, which um, some folks might look around and wonder when the last time a housing development actually uh, happened or was built in their community. Um, so what are some of the things that you guys do and kind of what does that look like, that legwork look like? Well, for a multifamily housing, right now we have been focusing on uh, acquisition of property and rehab of existing spots. Across New York State, we have roughly, and Jim, he's been doing this for a very long time. You can always jump in, Jim, when you're going, <laughs> uh, going off the reservation. But uh, we have roughly about 14,000 units that are sponsored by the United States Department of Agriculture across New York State. So that's a lot of units that have already been out there. It's not enough. It's certainly not enough. We recognize the need for affordable housing. So. We do the work in the rural communities, but we partner with the state of New York and HUD. And the state of New York gets into tax credits. It's kind of a sophisticated process, but if someone out there is looking at trying to bring some affordable housing into their community, give us a call. I've done it for many years. My former posting was with the uh, Housing and Urban Development as a project administrator for a local community. So I'm happy to sit with them and try and walk them through a process that, uh, whether it's senior housing, individual housing, we have many uh, programs between HUD and USDA that overlap in some areas, particularly if it's an entitlement community. And again, I know this gets into the ether a little bit, but if you're trying to buy uh, if, when we move past multifamily, but if you're trying to buy single family housing, make it affordable, both of our agencies have programs that you can participate in areas of the state that will give you a home savers club. There's also a down payment assistance program. And again, many of this is income based because mm -hmm. you're looking for an unmet need that you're trying to um, support homeowners. But there's a multitude of ways for Americans to participate in what is the American dream, which is home ownership. Right. Would you agree, Jim? Oh, I agree totally. Thank you, Director Mayfield. The other part, uh, the component of if our rural development is our single family housing, where um, there's two different type of programs if you're looking to purchase a home. One is our guaranteed program, which is done extremely well in New York State. So if someone is buying a home through a bank and a bank is looking for a guarantee, USDA Rural Development will guarantee that loan for the bank. And it's really basically a no money down loan. It can be 100% financed. The other uh, program if you're purchasing a home and you're very low income is a direct loan from USDA. Um, everybody remembers the old Farmers Home Administration loan from the early 90s. Well, that's the same program that's still out there. We'll subsidize the rate to bring the rate down to make the payment more affordable for uh, a home buyer. Um, the other component of our single family housing program is our uh, direct or our home equity uh, 504 program where we can provide a loan for someone to rehab their home or a grant for a uh, low-income senior over age 62. Um, as Director Mayfield had mentioned, we have uh, a lot of multifamily housing projects. 
And if you're a senior uh, living in your home, uh, you may need a roof or you, we, we want to be able to help you with a, a grant possibly to bring your house into a safe sanitary condition. Um, so instead of maybe moving into one of those housing projects, uh, a grant from us may be, able to be, may be able to be that resource for you to repair your home or make it handicap accessible so that you could stay in your home. Again, as the state director mentioned, it is based on your income, and I would suggest that people reach out to the local rural development offices throughout Western and Central New York and talk to one of our specialists if there's an interest called aging in place and if you think about it it makes a lot of sense if you've been in a community for 30 or 40 years living in your own home you know where the doctors are you know where the pharmacists are you know the the postman knows you and the boy scouts and the people at the diner and you're comfortable in your home and in the long run it's actually cheaper to keep folks in their own home as long as they have supportive services and adaptive ability to adapt the um, uh, housing stock so that it, maybe it's a ramp you need graspable handrails in the bathroom or whatever it is any of those things that keep seniors in their own homes they're happier they're healthier um, it's just the right thing to do for our seniors now to that end how much of how much of this uh, what you guys are trying to do on a on daily basis I'd imagine is just letting people know that it exists that these opportunities exist because I would imagine that there are probably quite a few people listening or watching right now who are thinking to themselves I had absolutely no idea that existed it's a constant battle I would bet you probably 50 percent of my day is administrative work you know counting the beans and you know making sure that the bills are getting paid but then the other 50 percent of it and this is the part that we love is getting out meeting with constituents meeting with residents across the state trying to see how we can provide assistance to them because let's again it's their money it's their government as old ben franklin used to say if you keep government close to the people it's going to be honest responsive and that's what we should be doing, right, Jim? I mean, that's oh, that's correct. a big part of your day. Oh, it is. And one of the things I wanted to mention, kind of a story, if, if you take one of the counties that I, I worked on in the past and you headed north out of town, heading towards Lake Ontario, you'd come into the first town and you would see a fire department on your right-hand side. And there's a new banquet room attached to that fire department. Well, that was financed by rural development, and it provides a, an area for... Um, banquets and services for that community. As you head out of town um, from that community, you will see a bunch of homes that were financed directly by us. You'll see a handicap accessible ramp. You'll see a new roof that was put on someone's home. And you come into the next town, you're going to see a fire department, another fire department on the right hand side. We financed that fire department. In the center of town was the old fire department, which was built in the early 50s, asbestos lane. Um, the supervisor was trying to figure out what to do with that building, and he decided to turn it into a community center, which was a wonderful thing for the community. It was also a place to pay your taxes and, and challenge and work on your assessment on your home. Um, so now, instead of having an empty building in the town, they have a nice community center, and that was financed by us. Uh, provided parking for everyone to come to the local town, to go to the uh, pharmacy, to pick up groceries at the store, provided public parking, provides a meeting house area. Um, as you leave that town and head north, you'll see a couple of farmers on, on both sides of the road. Um, and as you know, the grape industry has really taken off. Well, we've provided value-added grants to those farmers so they could take their end product and in this case turn it into grapes. So there was a, a grant program that provided assistance to those local farmers. And as you come into the last town right on Lake Ontario, you'll see the fire department on the right hand side. And guess what? We financed the fire department. But the other thing you'll notice is if you go onto Lake Ontario and your boat gets into trouble, the rescue boat that comes out to rescue you was financed by us. And if you come to shore and you're not doing well, that Mercy Flight helicopter that comes to pick you up to take you to the hospital was financed by us. And if you go to the emergency room at the hospital in Batavia, the emergency, was the emergency room was financed by us. So there are many things when you go through a local community, you may, you may look at it as oh, just another building or a home or anything like that. I look at it saying we've really helped the rural community, not only in, in New York, but across the country. And most importantly, it was a citizen, a council person, a village trustee yeah. who said, hey, there's a need here. 
how can I help this community to prosper and thrive? So again, it's generated from the ground up. This is not the old urban renewal that some of us with bald heads and gray hair remember where Washington comes in and tells you, you're gonna need this, you're gonna, no. It's a voluntary association. If you want our help and you want our assistance, we're an eager and willing partner. If you don't, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. The other yeah. thing, well, the other thing I was going to mention there, as we were building the community center, we realized that the water lines were bad in the town. So we financed the replacement and upgrade of the water lines. And within that town, we have two multifamily housing projects, one for uh, families and one for seniors. So we're all about that community and providing support in a rural area. And, and there's a lot of work to do in a lot of rural communities, uh, especially here in the Finger Lakes. Um, so on the, the business and economic development side, um, obviously it sounds like you guys play a pretty big role in helping some of these communities make, make moves on that side. Um, talk to us a little bit about what that experience is actually like, what that, that, that partnership looks like. So say someone reaches out to your office and says, you know, we think we want to do this or we have this idea. How can you help us? So what? walk us through that process, what that actually looks well, like. Well, that's the most important step is, is someone actually wanting to take the time to reach out. And we encourage you to do that. Yeah. We're a very high-touch agency for those of you that remember your old banking terms. And we want to be out there. So if you contact our offices, whether it's through email or uh, telephonically someone is going to get back to you someone is going to say hey let's get this project descriptor then we're going to come out into the community and take a look and see does this make sense we again most of 50 percent of my day is reaching out into communities and meeting with supervisors meeting with mayors meeting with trustees meeting with local citizens who say this could be a great idea so there are over Jim you'll correct me if I again get off over 40 different uh, funding vehicles within rural development. Is that correct? That right. is correct. <laughs> so depending on what the nature of the project is, maybe it's a hotel, maybe it's senior housing, maybe it's um, the financing like he talked about earlier for the uh, helicopters to do the Mercy flight, we will then try to research the opportunities for funding that exist and see if you match that program. Now, like anything in government, there's an application process and there's forms to fill out. But again, we're willing to be very, very helpful and cooperative while you're filling out that form. We're not just going to mail it to you and say, here, figure it out on your own, because right. that's not helpful. And then you submit it and it'll get reviewed and scored and ranked and there's underwriting involved. Because again, this is taxpayer dollars and we're very conscious of the fact that um, you know, we are stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. So you want these projects to cash flow and to, uh, particularly if it's an economic development activity, uh, and make sure that we're putting our uh, very limited taxpayer resources into an opportunity that's going to be successful. But again, while we may, in some aspects, act like a bank, we're a bank with a mission, and that mission is to develop uh, rural America and you may have an even more precise uh, example of s some project that comes springs to mind well I it, it just uh, as we I were thought talking, it might <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot uh, we have a, a initiative out right now called the rural economic development innovation what we call ready and we've already awarded four contracts to what we call collaborators that are going to come in and assist communities with developing economic plans and recently I've been talking with a uh, community right here in central New York that is looking to get into a uh, recreational economy. And it's not only one town, but it's several towns and a couple of counties that really want to develop the economy based around uh, a natural resource that's located within one of the towns or surrounding towns. I've talked to my partnership uh, friends throughout rural development and a couple of them have very successful uh, develops very very successfully develop um, recreational economies and I've gotten those facts and information and have forwarded to the individuals that are going to be putting the application in so they can again learn that system learn how to develop that uh, recreational economy 
blueprint to success and take the communities that are surrounding there and look for the new opportunities that are going to grow about developing those plans. So we're assisting them putting that application together. I've reached out to other partners that we have within rural development to get their information, bring that information back to that community so the community has some facts and figures and with any luck their application will score well and um, be funded so that we can help them develop the plans for a, uh, a nice projects or projects within the local towns and counties. And don't forget, our, we're not just limited to our USDA rural development resources. One of the initiatives that I'm so proud of that came about because of Secretary Sonny Perdue and SBA Administrator Linda McMahon, they have a wonderful collaboration. We have a memorandum of understanding between our two agencies where we uh, engage very deeply in joint efforts to develop and fund projects. So. Uh, Steve Bolger is my counterpart at the USDA or at the SBA. He's the regional administrator for New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, Virgin <laughs> Islands. He's it's got interesting territory. Yeah. But he's such a great partner. Just like uh, Secretary Purdue and Administrator McMahon, they really like each other and enjoy each other. And we'll come out and go through various communities. And SBA has a very mature program. They have the ability to. Uh, work directly with the banks and then the banks come in and, and if there's projects that require additional funding, USDA can come in in partnership with that. But the important thing from, from that story is, uh, to, the takeaway if you will, is that understanding that from the president and the administration right on down from the secretaries to our levels at the uh, state agencies is we want to hear from folks in these communities right. what can we do to help you and that's why you know Finger Lakes One giving us this forum today is just so invaluable for us and we appreciate that very much. Now to that end I, I have to wonder just from covering uh, local boards and sort of some of the regional councils it seems like one of the big the, the big sticking point for a lot of folks right now isn't as much the business and economic development side as it is infrastructure, 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 especially in some of these smaller rural communities, which may have a uh, hundred plus year old utilities, various things like that, um, water, sewer, that kind. Um, talk to us a little bit about, has, has, that, has that need been vocalized more to you guys in recent years than maybe 10 or 15 years ago? Well, I'm, I'm happy you uh, raised <laughs> that because we were just over with Congressman Reed's office. Allison Hunt is uh, the congressman's district director. She is an incredibly energetic and knowledgeable staffer and I used to be a congressional staffer years ago in the dark ages but uh, yeah and there's no question the congressman's office as well as the president and the administration recognize that infrastructure is absolutely critical and it has been neglected over the years whether it's a lack of maintenance or a lack of investments or targeting resources someplace else but uh, yeah it's everywhere we we go uh, Jim I'm sure you hear the same cry from all of our supervisors and mayors how can you help us out with infrastructure which there is our community facilities program which is uh, highly utilized by uh, various communities but Jim got a couple of good examples on CF that might uh, intrigue some of our uh, listeners well the community facilities program can be used for a lot of uh, a lot of different things for not-for-profits um, daycare centers um, fire departments police station police vehicles uh, highway garages um, pretty much anything that you could think of that a rural community would need uh, expansion of a college I know we work with several colleges in central New York to uh, increase their broadband service within the college uh, increase their again water and sewer one of our our main um, programs that we administer in I know in Western New York and the town supervisors the mayors the engineers the fiscal advisors really have gotten to know uh, rural developments water and wastewater program and we've done a lot of projects throughout central New York Western New York um, last year uh, our fiscal year ends September 30th 
and there was some extra money sitting in Washington and because of the work of Mr. Mayfield's staff, they had projects ready for funding and we pulled in a lot more money than uh, most states across the country, which is great because I like to see money come back to central and western New York. And that was all in the water wastewater projects. Um, so that we're getting water lines and sewer lines uh, out to rural residents on, you know, double the basis than what we've done in the past years. So. And, and to that end, obviously, uh, when we talk about infrastructure, now we're also talking about broadband access. Um, and that's a big one that's been a priority for the state. I'm sure it's, you guys have seen your own, uh, your own level of interest from uh, smaller communities. To that end, uh, still not everybody's totally satisfied with the speed at which uh, this is progressing. In some of these more rural uh, communities, I think, like Schuyler, Steuben County, uh, Yates County, uh, some of the ones that are a little more on the fringe here in the Finger Lakes. Mm -hmm. um, walk us through what you guys sort of see as a forecast or expect uh, over the next five to ten years so that these small rural communities can uh, keep folks living there and, and also still remain competitive to some of the places where broadband access is getting better and stronger and faster. Well, you've, you've used a word that uh, is on our lips every day and that's the competition factor. If you're not able to um, respond to market conditions and you're not able to have your um, potential customers coming across with whether it's trying to get a reservation at that local B&B &B or utilizing the ability of the internet for online orders or supporting uh, your stores and local communities, whether it's education, we've heard stories all the time about you know, students who have to go to the uh, parking lot in one of the local supermarkets or hotels where they're, because that's where the best internet access is, or they're going to use up, you know, their um, the megs at home for, you know, two or three hundred dollars to try and do that paper. So, absent this significant investment, rural America does not compete. Forget about thriving. Is that, we is just it, don't compete. Is it it's an that existential critical. Existential threat. Is that the the most pressing ex it existential is, threat? It is for the future. Right. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, short term, sure. We can all look at the sidewalks and water, and we understand that. Right. And those of us that are a little bit, uh, you know, blonde headed, we we can understand that. But if you're not able to access that rapid information, particularly when it comes, even our farmers. You know, I, my cousin is still a dairy farmer down in uh, um, Sullivan County area of, of the state, and he walks around with his tablet, and he can tell how much he's fed this cow, and how much milk this is right in the field. But they're getting commodity prices. It's real time. It, the, the old days, if you get up at four o'clock in the morning, you watch RFD TV for you know <laughs> an hour and get oh. some crop reports. Oh. Long gone. It's it's just constant. So. Yeah, it's absolutely critical to the success of rural America. Absent it, it's going to be a big problem for Is us. Is that one of the aspects that might maybe surprise some of the folks listening, that farmers are, are often the ones who are championing this cause and saying, hey, we need this, we need it badly? I, I bet you they, they are surprised because, you know, there's a certain uh, view of the bucolic farm and it just kind of chugs along the way it did for the last 150 years. But these are high-tech, high-capacity, highly capitalized operations now. It's, it's incredibly competitive to succeed in farming. And I think if you were to ask any farmer, they're very proud you know they truly don't want a lot of help they're rugged individualist people but if you are growing up on a farm or growing up in a rural community you very quickly learn that we replaces me mm -hmm. you can't do it all on your own anymore it requires you to have relationships with your communities whether it's the mechanic whether it's the guy that knows how to weld something the veterinary it's just an absolute partnership so if you're going to survive in a rural area we need everybody operating at their fullest capacity now to that end uh, as a follow-up i guess is there enough is there enough money to go around is there enough money as you guys look forward um to to be able to keep rural america or rural parts of new york as an example 
competitive with the Rochester's, Syracuse, the New York Cities, the, the Buffalo's, the urban, the more developed uh, areas? Well, I'll, I'll speak somewhat on a policy level. If you look at the amount of funding that's available, the funds are uh, certainly out there, but we don't want to look like we're in complete competition with the cities. Our efforts should be to complement the efforts that are being done within the cities. And it takes rural America partnering with our cousins in the city because where are the markets? Mm -hmm. The markets are not necessarily in Beeville. The markets are going to be in the Rochesters, the New York Cities, uh, the Buffaloes, the Binghamtons. So getting that product, that commodity into those larger areas that access is economically very important. I'm glad you brought that up because we actually have a conversation uh, with some urban planning folks uh, planned in the next month or so. Um, and, and that connection that you're talking about, that rural urban connection, do you think there needs to be more collaboration, more working together with folks in, in Rochester to, to a Penyan or a place like that? Um, and where you know maybe some of the folks in some of the rural communities could, could learn some things about how to sort of maximize what they're doing in their own community? Oh, I, I think so. And I think I think there is a recognition within, particularly the business community. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, the business of America is business. But uh, bringing those resources together, there's an ex incredibly interesting quality of life that exists within rural America that cannot be replicated anywhere else. But there's the economic activity and the energy that goes on in our urban areas and you bring those two components together and this truly is the greatest country mm -hmm. on the face of the planet you know again if you if you've had the opportunity to travel europe and and uh, caribbean and other areas and and uh, i know uh, mike has done some ex extensive travel as well across the country uh, across the world you realize what we have here is incredibly special you have to take care of it. it has to be nurtured it doesn't just happen overnight but yes those relationships between urban areas and rural areas we can do a better job communicating with each other no question about it but um, working together all boats rise mike you've seen some pretty tough countries in your travels well and i want to mention some of the way we're bridging the gap this gap is between our distant learning and telemedicine program so we're connecting uh, major hospitals and, and urban areas with rural communities with our telemedicine program to provide that top-notch service that's needed in a rural area. And the distant learning program is fantastic. Being able to use that throughout all of the central and southern tier area, southern tier area has been exceptional. Um, the other portion of what uh, I think we're bridging the gap is we're seeing that the rural workforce is, is becoming a stronger economy that people want to keep their local students within the, the area because of the technology and because of the education they're getting. Um, they want to keep those students within the rural areas to support local growth within the economy um, of our southern and central New York. And also there's an ability for our agency to fund. Again, we operate in many instances as a bank. So if there is a rural in character or, or uh, what we would define as a service area, potentially we could be a financer in a city that you wouldn't ordinarily think Rochester springs to mind as a, a city where we've had a very interesting activity and adaptive reuse on the old uh, um, Kodak facility and that is a significant project and we're very excited about that and it's going to not only lead to uh, agribusiness within the city of Rochester but helps to feed and ship out contracts supporting uh, numerous supermarkets across this part of the state so that's it's interesting again folks who are listening to uh, Finger Lakes One just call us and ask if you've got an idea. We'll mm -hmm. spend some time and figure it out. And if we don't have the ability, one of the charges from our secretary is we're kind of supposed to be the lobby fox right. for uh, to right. search other agencies. And every week, Mike sends us an update of various grants and programs from other agencies. We send it out all over the state so that folks, you know, searching out the money is half the battle. So we're trying to 
you know, make that easier for you to access these resources. And if you're interested, we'll put you in touch with the folks that can help you. So one of the issues that kind of touches on all the things that we've talked about so far, um, transportation. That's one of the one of the issues that we kind of see pop up in, in rural parts of the Finger Lakes. Um, is that one of the things that you guys sort of hear about is kind of overlapping onto the other areas where we've been sort of touching on throughout the half hour here? Transportation is a challenge and it is, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. There are uh, programs that support whether your local county uh, could be involved in a, a TIP program or, um, you know, there, there are supportive avenues to offset the cost, but the last dial-a-bus system that I was involved with, my recollection would be it was almost $20 a head per participant, and as you know, you're uh, supported with the local tax dollars, the community has to offset for the driver, the gas, the yeah. maintenance, and I think they are allowed to ask for a dollar donation. Mm -hmm. So it's a um, it's an expensive proposition, but Jim, you might have run across uh, one or two of those things as well. Well, when we were talking about the uh, the one area that was looking at the recreational economy, one of the things they talked about was transportation. You know, you're centrally located between several major cities uh, and millions of people, but what does the transportation system look like in making that happen for that community? So those are the things that we're going to have to bring in experts in to help those communities develop a plan that will overcome those uh, transportation issues. I mean, they talked about an, an Uber driver, um, but again, the, one person will not be able to support uh, if the economy takes off around the, the state park. So uh, so there's significant challenges that are out there, and, and I think some of the communities recognize that this is something they need to work on. And the main takeaway is to contact us and, and we'll reach out to our other federal partners because we're not going to be alone. If I can't find an answer, let's talk to our other federal partners like SBA, our uh, Memorandum of Understanding with them. Uh, I've partnered with them before and they've actually sent a, uh, a grocery store applicant to us for financing because it didn't meet their guidelines and vice versa. So we're always talking about how we can collaborate together. Um, Department of Labor, Department of Transportation um, are just new organizations we're starting to work with. Health and Human Services, they have um, great programs. Again, we need to understand those programs so as we talk to our communities, we say, oh yeah, I know someone over at Health and Human Services that has something that may be able to help you out. And then we connect the two of those so they can start talking and see how they can develop a plan to help their community. And, and it's not always just government. Oftentimes the private sector will step up and be supportive. We've had a couple of instances where local shopping centers have come together and two or three times a week they're, uh, they will charter the bus that goes into the senior center and mm -hmm. it's, uh, um, you know, there's a symbiotic relationship. So again, it's, it's not always government is the solution to everything. Government working with the private sector. So, and one more time for, for those uh, those listening, those watching, how can they connect with you? How can they uh, Well, your first step, and I'm happy you asked that. We have our, our most uh, accessible office for you here would be our Canandaigua office, and the telephone number there is 315-477-6400. It's located at 3037 County Route County Road 1110 right there in Canandaigua and you've got some wonderful people there and they're gonna kill me when I do this but <laughs> Roosevelt Caldwell, Casey Chamberlain and Cindy Ebert they're just uh, great public servants and they're always looking forward to hearing from our constituency to see how they can help them. If you uh, can't catch them you can go to our website which is at uh, uh, www.usda.ny.gov and you can find us there. My number is also there. You're welcome to email me or s call the state office which is 315-477-6435 I believe is my direct <laughs> line and if it's not it'll ring into another desk and they'll they'll find me for you. So again don't uh, don't limit yourself. We want to hear from you. All right. Appreciate the time, fellas. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for uh, talking to us about this. Thank you. Thank you.